Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is definitely an interesting one, but it's so, so very frustrating how this entire thing was handled because it definitely had the potential to be solved, but because of so many different missteps by the police, we still don't know who truly is responsible for this heinous murder. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Babbel. Now, I took Spanish in high school, but the second I graduated, I completely forgot everything that I had learned because I just did not stick with it. But I really like to travel, especially to Mexico and Costa Rica, and knowing how to speak and understand Spanish is so very important when you're traveling to countries that speak the language. Plus, living in Arizona, there are a lot of Spanish speakers here, and I work in healthcare, so it's so, so very important to me to be able to work with all patients, whether they're Spanish speakers or not. Babbel is a great place to learn because they teach you practical real-world conversations through short 10-minute lessons. Plus, their lessons are created by real language teachers, not algorithms or AI. They also use speech recognition in their lessons, which is really nice for me because I struggle to pronounce a lot of things, as a lot of you guys may have noticed by now, so getting that type of feedback is very, very helpful for me. Ever since starting Babbel, I feel like I have such a greater ability to make connection with people around me when I'm traveling to Spanish-speaking countries or when I'm working with Spanish-speaking patients. I'm not perfect yet, but being able to understand what people are telling me and being able to respond is such an important skill. There's a reason why Babbel is the number one language learning app, and that's because their lessons are so helpful and they're so easy to navigate. Plus, they have award-winning technology that get you speaking in your language in just three weeks. Start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. You can get 65% off of your subscription by using my link down below or scanning the QR code right here. Again, use my link down below or scan the QR code for 65% off of your subscription to Babbel. Thank you again so much to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. And with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the heinous murder of Kent Heitholt. Kent Heitholt was born January 4th, 1953 in Lawrence, Kansas. From there, he attended John Burroughs High School in St. Louis, Missouri, then went on to study journalism at the University of Missouri. While there, Kent met his wife, Deborah. The two got married on December 21st, 1981, and they went on to have two children, Vincent and Callie Rose. Kent was described as a gentle, kind, man who was the type of person who could get along with just about anybody. He was an animal lover who was known to put out food for stray cats in the area. From the time that Kent was very young, he absolutely loved sports. He initially moved to Louisiana to work for nine years as a sports editor at the Chevre Report Times. However, by 1996, he started work as a sports editor for the Tribune newspaper in Columbia, Missouri. In his career, Kent was known to gravitate towards the more overlooked sports. He gave women's sports equal attention to men's sports. He was known by his co-workers as someone who got along with everyone, which could be difficult for some people due to the big egos that a lot of people have in the journalism and sports industries sometimes. He was sincere, hardworking, and others looked up to him and saw him as an example of how to do things the right way while still making work fun. When he was in the position of being a manager, he was still known as being fun-loving and so much fun to work with. He was known to hire talented, experienced writers, but also for giving the underdog a chance as well. He would hire someone who had no experience whatsoever as long as they showed that they were eager to work hard in the profession. He had a soft side for the underdog and didn't have much time for people with inflated egos. One of the writers who worked under Kent described that Kent was just this big bear of a lovable guy. He said that he made the Tribune a fun place to work, going on to say, quote, it was always lots of laughs. It was like having a dad for a boss, end quote. 
He was a hands-off type of boss, but if you had a question, he would be the first to figure out an answer and help you with whatever it was you needed help with. He truly took care of his staff, and even outside of the office, everyone enjoyed his company and spending time with him. On the evening of Halloween, so October 31st, 2001, the sports staff at the Tribune had to work pretty late that evening. It seemed like a pretty typical evening at work, but they had a lot of work to do in relation to a basketball thing that was coming up. I don't exactly know what it was, but that's why they were there so late. Throughout the entire evening, Kent had been chatting with his coworker, Michael Boyd. The two had been chatting pretty much all throughout the entire evening, and according to Michael, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary for Kent. He said that the two had very pleasant conversations all throughout their work shift, as they always had. At around 2 a.m., Michael said that he left work because it was at this time that all of the computers for the sports staff had shut off. But as Michael was leaving, he stopped by Kent to ask for some phone numbers of some coaches that he needed to get into contact with. After he left at around 2.10, Michael went into the parking lot and he actually saw the cat that Kent had normally fed clawing at the tire of Kent's car. Michael thought this was funny because again, Kent was known to stop and feed the stray cats around the parking lot pretty much every single night. He kept bags of food in his car, so the cat was probably waiting by Kent's car, waiting for his midnight snack. As Michael was in his car and was backing up to leave work, he he also noticed that Kent had left the building and was in the parking lot, and this was at around 2.13ish. Before leaving the parking lot, Michael rolled his window down and pulled up to Kent so that the two could chat again. He told Michael about the cat that was using his tire as a scratching post, and the two had a laugh. They then talked about a couple of other work-related things, and the two talked for about five minutes before Michael said that he left the parking lot and went home. As Michael was leaving the parking lot, he said that he saw Kent going headfirst into his car. He said at this time, he doesn't know if he was getting into his car to leave and go home or if he was leaning in to grab the bag of cat food. He said that at this time, he didn't see anybody else in the parking lot except Kent. He said it was at around 2.20 a.m. when he finally left the parking lot and went home. Now, going back just a little bit, at around 9.30 p.m. on that same night, so October 31st, the cleaning crew had arrived to the Tribune to do their nightly cleaning duties. As they were cleaning, one of the cleaners named Jerry Trump reported that by 2 a.m. he decided to go outside for a smoke break. At this time, he called over his coworker, Shauna, to come take a smoke with him. This was something that that they normally did. It was pretty much in their routine to take their smoke breaks together. So, as he was finishing up cleaning a urinal, he told Shauna to go outside before him and just wait for him that he would be outside to smoke with her in just a minute. However, only about two to three minutes after this, Shauna returned back inside to talk to Jerry. At this time, Jerry could just tell by the look on Shauna's face that she was really scared about something. So, he asked her what was wrong and she said that she had just seen two people kneeling down next to Kent's car and she said that something about this just gave her a really bad feeling. So when Jerry went outside to look, he initially said that he saw someone crouch down next to the rear tire of Kent's car on the opposite side to where Jerry was standing and he initially thought that maybe this was Kent down there and he was changing a tire. However, after yelling Kent's name, multiple times without anybody answering, he looked more closely. And at this time, he saw that there was actually somebody laying on the ground next to the car. Then he saw a third person crouching down in the front of the car, also on the opposite side to where Jerry was standing. He continued yelling in that direction until eventually both of the individuals who were crouching stood up. Then one of them yelled to Jerry saying, someone's hurt over here, man. At this time, as the two men were standing, Jerry saw them a little bit clearer. 
they were both white men with the one that was initially crouched behind the rear wheel being taller than the other man, so the one that was at the front of the car. He noticed that the man who was crouching down at the rear tire of the car looked to be about in his 20s. He had a stocky build and he was wearing a baseball cap and it looked like he had blonde hair. At this time, Jerry feared for both his and Shauna's safety, so he went back inside. At this time, Shauna was standing at the doorway behind Jerry, so she also kind of got a good look at everything that was going on, but obviously Jerry escorted her back in so that she could be safe. Once he knew that Jerry was inside, Jerry went back outside and saw both of the men walking away, going eastbound in an alley up a hill from the parking lot. Once he saw that these men had left, he went back outside and looked closer at the scene, and he immediately noticed that the man who was laying on the ground was actually Kent. He was recognizable because Kent was a really big guy, and even though he couldn't necessarily see his face, he knew that it was him. As he got closer, he saw that Kent was laying face down with both of his legs underneath the car. He then saw that the back of Kent's head was covered in blood and it looked like there was multiple wounds in his head. He then saw a pool of blood, which was clearly coming from Kent's head. Of course, at this time, he yelled for Shauna to call 911 and she did. This call took place at around 2.26 a.m. In the phone call, Shauna isn't totally sure what just happened. She said that she was just told to call the police then Jerry took over and described the situation to the dispatcher. 911, what is your emergency? Um, we need someone here at the Conley Daily Tribune. What's going on? I'm, I'm not sure. I was just told to call 911. There's somebody hurt outside. Okay, I, is there anybody who can tell me what's going on there? We need here. We're at the main building at the Tribune. You're at the 101 4th Street? Yeah, yeah. And what's going on? In the parking lot behind where Kentucky Fried Chicken used to be. The sports editor, Kent laying on the ground, pool of blood. Looks like he'd been shot or something. There were two boys out there, two young guys just a minute ago. Okay, he's on the parking lot behind the Tribune on the KFC side? Yes, yes. Hold on just a second, okay? All right. Okay, what's his name? Kent is his name. Okay. I don't know, high school or something. Don't go outside. Okay, who did you see? Who did you see in the area? Who did you see in the area? I saw two guys in the area. Were they white or black? White. I'd say 1920. What were they wearing? I I don't know. This gal, uh, if I get her calm down, she can give a report probably to the police a little bit. Okay. But she saw them. She walked out to okay. smoke a cigarette. Saw them duck down behind the car. Okay. I looked out and saw them, and I said, what's going on? I knew it was Kent's car, and I said, Kent, and they didn't look up. Nobody did anything. So, but Dan, Kent can you just that for me? Somebody's been hurt, man. Okay, so you saw them duck down behind his car? Yes. Well, yeah, somebody's been hurt. Okay. He left here, they said 15, or what they say, 30 minutes ago. I mean, left the building. Okay. Okay, and then where did they go after that? I don't know, up, up towards the new building, uh, towards 4th Street, I guess it's 4th, towards the front of the Tribune building. Okay, so just to make sure though, he's down on the parking lot. Yes. Uh, okay, we need to have some people standing out there to direct I'll the officers. I'll be out there, I'll be okay, what, was your, what was your name, sir? My name is Jerry. Jerry? Yes. Jerry, what's your last name, real quick? Trump, T-R-U-M-P. Okay, do you remember any kind of description at all on these guys? I don't, because, okay. well, they, they, they were close to six feet uh, thin. Okay, so they're 19 headed towards 4th Street. Yeah. One of them had blonde hair. Really, really short blonde hair. Do they either one of them have hats or caps or jackets? I gotta get her calmed down a little bit before I think she's gonna be able to come up with it. Okay. Oh, Is anybody uh, out there with uh, the the man down? No. Well, I don't know. Did what's his name go out there? Who is that guy that you went in there? Yeah. I don't know. I Somebody needs to go check on. Okay. Him. Rush is okay. out there. Okay, Jerry. Uh, give me a directional. They were headed towards Fourth Street. So would that would have been east or? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would have been east. Okay. And I'd say south. I'd say southeast, but I don't know that for sure because 
they took off, you know, and they went up that alleyway towards 4th. Okay. Okay. All right, we've got officers on the way over there right now. All right, we'll be out there. Okay, thank you. After this, Jerry went up to the sports section of the office where people were still working to let them know what had just happened. At this point, two employees literally jolted up and they started sprinting over to the parking lot to try and help Kent. But at that time, they checked his pulse and they realized that he had been killed. When police arrived on scene, they found that there was a large amount of blood surrounding Kent's body, as well as blood spatter and smears all around. Next to Kent's body, they found a belt buckle laying on the ground near his head, which appeared to have been Kent's belt buckle. They also noticed that there were red marks around Kent's neck, which appeared to be ligature marks. Then, when they inspected his body and his clothes, they found that there was a large amount of blood on his pants, and the way that it was on his pants, it showed that he had been kneeling down at some point. They found several basketball schedules, a lens from a pair of glasses, and a cell phone all scattered around Kent's car, then they found a pile of cat food near Kent's car. Police had also found several fingerprints and blood smears all around Kent's car. However, upon examination, police found that most of these fingerprints either belonged to Kent himself or they were unusable and not able to be tested to see if they matched anybody. However, they did find multiple latex prints from an unknown individual inside of the car, so it showed that someone who went through his car was wearing latex gloves gloves. Then, when they investigated the blood found at the scene as well as on his clothes, they realized that all of the blood belonged to Kent, so there was no unknown individuals that could lead them anywhere. All of the blood was his. They also found shoe prints in the blood around the scene as well. Upon autopsy examination, they found that Kent had been brutally attacked. He had been struck in the head from behind with a blunt object 11 times. They found that his hands had also been covered in multiple wounds as well, which was thought to have been from him trying to cover his head to protect himself from the attack. Then they found that he had been strangled with his own belt until the leather snapped and the belt buckle fell off. However, the actual belt itself has never been found. They said that even though Kent had been hit multiple times in the head with a blunt object, his actual cause of death was strangulation. They also found that there was DNA under Kent's fingernails as well as a strand of hair in his hand, but none of this seemed to lead investigators in any direction. For two years, investigators tried speaking with whatever witnesses they could get information from and try to gather any information that they could, but the case just stood still with absolutely no leads. All they found out was what I discussed earlier about the two witnesses that saw these two men near Kent's car right after he was murdered, so... They didn't really have a description, they didn't have DNA, they didn't have any leads that could lead them anywhere. By February of 2003, the FBI did get involved and they started re-interviewing witnesses. Shauna was re-interviewed and she was able to come up with a composite sketch from one of the men that she saw that night. She described the individual near the rear tire as having a rectangular head that was longer than average, a square chin that was wider than average. I eyes that were closer together than average, a nose that was narrow at the base, small lips that were wider than average, ears that protruded outwards at the tops but with earlobes that were close set to his head, and blonde hair that was combed forward and flipped up in the front. Of course, this sketch was released to the public for anybody to see if they could identify who this man was. Then, by March 10th of 2004, a witness came forward saying that they actually knew exactly who was responsible for the murder. This witness said that a 17-year-old teenager named Charles Erickson was telling people around him that he had a dream about the case after seeing an article about it 
in the newspaper. This witness said that Charles had brought this up to a mutual friend saying that he was worried about what he had dreamt about saying that he couldn't remember exactly what happened but he was a little bit worried that he may have been involved with this crime. But the friend said that there was no way that he could have been involved, it was just a dream so this fear was set aside for a while. However, once the composite sketch came out, Charles was worried that it looked just like him. So he went to his friends, Nick Gilpin and Art Figuera. He told them about the dream and how he was worried that he may have been involved and he said that he looked like this sketch, but he couldn't remember anything. These two witnesses thought that this story was weird enough for them to go ahead and call the police and report what they had just learned. So Nick Gilpin went into the station for questioning and he told police that Charles admitted to him that he and another 17-year-old Ryan Ferguson had strangled Kent to death. So immediately, police found Charles and they took him in for questioning as well. At the beginning of the interview, he said that everything was so, so foggy and that he could not remember a lot and he even said that he could be making everything up. But the longer he sat in that interrogation room without providing police with answers, the more antsy and pushy police got. They continued asking him questions and doing everything that they could to get him to admit to everything that he allegedly did. So, I'm going to summarize everything that was said over the course of multiple interviews. I will include clips of these interviews if I can in just a few minutes, and I will also summarize everything that people think was wrong with these interrogations. So, Charles said that on the night of October 31st, 2001, he and Ryan had been at a nearby nightclub called By George in Columbia, Missouri, and they had run out of money. Normally, the two of them would go to Ryan's sister if they ran out of money or if they needed money, but that night, she was refusing to give them any money. So, Charles and Ryan decided to leave and they thought of the plan to find somebody to rob. Charles said that Ryan had grabbed a tire tool from the trunk of his car and then they walked over to the Tribune where they saw Kent. At this time, he said that Ryan told Charles to go over to Kent and hit him in the head. So he did and Kent screamed, but he didn't fall down, he was still staggering. Charles also noted that after he initially hit Kent with the tire tool that he might have thrown up. Then Charles said that Ryan wanted to make sure that Kent was actually dead, so Ryan is the one that knocked Kent down to the ground and then strangled Kent until he made sure that he was actually dead. He said that they did see a cleaning lady at the doorway before she ran back inside. Then Charles said that he saw Ryan go through Kent's car and then it took something before the two of them left. As they were leaving, Charles said that they bumped into another man named Dallas Malloroy. When they saw him, Charles said that Ryan told him that they had just beat down a guy. Charles said that he later spoke with Ryan about the incident and Ryan said that he had always wanted to kill somebody anyways. Then, a few years after the incident, Charles said that he tried talking to Ryan about the murder again, but this time, Ryan told Charles that if he ever told anybody about the murder, that Ryan would kill him. Now, throughout these interviews, police asked Charles several questions that he just could not remember. One example was when police asked Charles what Ryan used to strangle Kent, and Charles said that he couldn't remember. He said that maybe it was a shirt or maybe it was a bungee cord, but police ended up telling him that it was neither of these. They said that he was strangled with his own belt and Charles said that he actually did not remember that happening. Charles also told the police that he believed that Kent was hit one time on his head with the tire tool, but investigators told him that he was actually hit 11 times. He also said that he could not remember the route that Ryan and him took after the murder. Then police took Charles to the murder scene to try and jog his memory of what happened since again, 
he said that it was foggy and he was having trouble remembering things. This is something that sometimes will happen. They'll bring the perpetrator back to the scene of the crime to see if it jogs their memory, see if they can remember anything, or for the perpetrator to lead them to where it happened. But when they got there, Charles could not lead them to where the attack happened in the parking lot. So it was said that throughout all of these interviews, police basically suggested things to Charles and eventually he was just starting to go along with their version of events. Right now, your hind end is the one that's hanging over the edge and Ryan could care less about it. Okay? okay? Do you understand me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you better start thinking very clearly okay. because it's you that is on this chopping block. Okay. Am I clear yes. to you? Yes. You guys needed money. I, this is, this is, all right, this is after reading the newspaper article in October. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of what I put together with, I mean, I don't know if I'm just flipping out or whatever, but I mean, this is kind of what I put together with what could have happened. We, I remember we were at the club, we ran out of money, like he'd been asking his sister to borrow money, and then from there on, I'm just kind of presuming what happened. I'm making presumptions based on what I read in the newspaper. When you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangling this guy, now, we know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of a thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was struggling with and just didn't want to tell me? Because I, I know. I don't know. Like, I think it was a shirt or something. Or yeah, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. Like, uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was struggling with his belt. Really? Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope, maybe, or a bungee cord? I don't know. Okay. You didn't put anything in your hand, though? No. Okay. I mean, I don't even remember that at all. Okay. Um, so it's possible Ryan could have strangled this guy with his belt, got the keys, and you not know. With the guy's, the man's belt? Yeah. His own belt? Yes. Does that ring a bell? Not at all. Like, I didn't. But you saw Ryan strangling him, though. I thought, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, I might not even know what I'm talking about now. Well, like I said, you you told us something only people anywhere ever know. So that's that's not even. What is that? I like what? Again, playing poker. Hold that. I mean, you remember what you told me. You remember what's going on. Yeah. Going back to when you said that, that, that you hit this guy with with the with the with the tool. Said you got you kind of got sick after that. Um, how many times did you think you hit him all together? Just once. Just once. Well, the only problem the only problem I have with that is I know that he was hit more than once. With, yeah. with the tool. Because I'm saying like I just hit him once. You just hit him once. You didn't hit him more than no. like. Okay. You'd said earlier, though, that it was possible that you may have hit him more than once. Is that, di is that different now? No, I didn't hit him more than once. Okay. Number one, I just went and looked at this guy's crime scene photographs, for the, hopefully for the last time until I ever have to look at him again. Multiple, multiple, multiple contusions, hits, and strikes on this guy's head. There is no way in hell that you hit this guy once, turn around, and got sick. If you only hit him once, turn away, and got sick, you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking... Minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it then. But it's just, I don't, I can't recollect. I mean, it's just a trip for me to have to sit here and try to look at something that happened that I've read about and try to base well, what I, mean, I remember off of that. You know, it's, let, it's let's, a mind let, fuck. You know? let's, let's just stop right here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit here and listen to this kind of gibberish, okay? That's not, I'm gonna waste my time doing it. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, now listen, it's my, I'm gonna start talking, okay, and you're gonna start listening, okay? All right, I'm gonna be point blank with you, pal. Right now, your hind end is the one that's hanging over the edge, and Ryan could care less about it. Okay. Okay? Do you understand me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you better start thinking very clearly okay. because it's you that is on this chopping block. Okay. Am I clear yes. to you? Yes. Now, do we need to go by or go back and go through this step by step? No. Well, I think we do and that's what we're going to do. 
And I don't want to hear, oh, all of a sudden I just think I'm going to refabricate all this. And, uh, wow. No. What I want to hear is exactly what Ryan told you because that's what's going to keep you in a position to where you're not going to be the sole individual out here responsible for what happened to Kent. Okay. Okay? Yeah. I can't be any more clear to you than that. I understand. And that. you need to understand it. Okay. Leave. I don't know. And, I mean, like, I don't even, it's just so foggy, like, I could just be sitting here fabricating all of it and not know. Like, I don't know. I don't. For all I know, I could have just flipped out, man. I don't know. I've explained to you already that it is essential that you remember every detail the best you can and I mean it could be in that specifically part. wait wait wait, 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 wait. just listen to me just listen to me okay just just listen because I need to know what Ryan's actions were in detail I need to know what your actions were I don't were, know what they were in but detail. I need to know I don't I don't Ryan's know. also Okay, well, well, you have to ask me specifically, because okay. there's a lot that I do not remember. Okay, well, I'm sure there is. Now, can you tell me exactly where this happened? Yes, we're going to go right up to the parking lot. Here's the parking lot. Now, some things may have changed a little bit. Of course, there's a lot of vehicles in the parking area. But you see where this Jeep is at right up here? This kind of a beige colored Jeep with a black roof. That is the parking spot where uh, Mr. Heidholt had his car parked. Um, looking at this area, does this look familiar to you? And, and the door being right here, uh, loading dock area. I mean, I don't remember, I don't remember most of what happened. So going off of this, police took Ryan Ferguson in and they questioned him about what happened. He told police that about three weeks before they brought Ryan in for questioning, Charles had told him about the dream that he had about them killing Kent. He went on to say that the night in question, he was at by George at the club the entire night. But he said that after the club closed, they spoke with Ryan's sister. He said that he actually didn't run out of money that night, nor did he ask his sister to borrow any money. After this, he said that him and Charles had left the bar and Ryan drove Charles home. He said that he had absolutely nothing to do with the murder. So, after this, police went ahead and questioned the various witnesses that Charles had brought up. First, they questioned Dallas Malroy. Remember, Charles said that they ran into this man after killing Kent that night. So, Dallas actually told police that he did not see or talk to either men that night. However, police thought that Dallas was not telling the truth, that maybe he just didn't want to get himself in trouble for not reporting a murder, so they administered a voice stress test to see if he was lying, and they thought that based on the results of this test, that he was being deceptive. So, they asked him again, and he continued to say that he did not remember seeing either Charles or Ryan that night. Now, as we know, these types of lie detection tests are not the most reliable. In fact, a voice stress test is even less reliable than a polygraph test, so take all of this with a grain of salt. Then, Dallas came out to say that police tried coercing him into making a statement. He said that when he told police that he had not seen Charles or Ryan that night, that police started yelling at him and getting agitated with him and telling him that if he didn't tell them the truth, that he was going to be the one who was charged with murder. Then police spoke with another woman named Megan Arthur. She told police about what they had spoken about on the night of October 31st, 2003, so two years after the murder. At this time, she reportedly said that Ryan had been drunk and high on something uppity like cocaine. She said that Ryan told her that Charles was trying to get him to turn themselves in for Kent's murder. She said that Ryan told her that him and Charles did do something stupid, but that he didn't want to turn himself in for it. 
She said that the conversation started making her scared and upset. And when Ryan noticed this, he said, Megan, calm down. I was just kidding. However, in later interviews with Megan conducted by different authorities, Megan denied ever saying that Ryan was drunk or high that night. She denied saying that Ryan made her scared that night. She denied saying that he was uppity. She said that Ryan had had three beers at most that night and he was actually very laid back and calm, not jittery or uppity on drugs. She said that what actually had happened was that she overheard Ryan talking to somebody else about how Charles was trying to get him to turn himself in for a crime but she said that Ryan seemed genuinely confused as to what Charles was trying to get him to turn himself in for. Then another witness came forward to police saying that he also had concerning information about the murder. This witness, Richard Walker, said that Ryan had told him that after going to a bar one night, that him and Charles decided to rob and kill somebody. He said that he was told that they had hit Kent in the head with a tire tool, but that, you know, Ryan kept telling Charles that Kent wasn't hurt that bad and that he didn't think that they killed him. But he said that Charles and Ryan stopped being friends because Charles kept asking Ryan all of these questions, so he didn't want to answer them, so they stopped talking. Then police once again questioned the cleaner at the Tribune that night, Jerry Trump, and they asked him if he was able to identify the men that he saw that night. As we know, from the 911 call, he could not provide any description of what these men looked like. At some point, Jerry went to jail for an unrelated crime after Kent's murder, but he said that while he was in jail, his wife Barbara had brought him a newspaper with a story about Ryan and Charles, and he said that suddenly, after seeing this picture, he remembered that these were the men that he saw that night. So now going back a little bit, after the initial interview with Richard, police interviewed him for a second time and they said that he gave the exact same information the second time that he provided in the first interview. However, Richard would later say that he also did not make the statements that police are claiming he made. But it later came out once again that the reason that Richard took back his original statements was because him and Ryan had actually come up with a plan where Richard would make these false statements and then recant his statements later. This was in exchange for Ryan's family providing Richard's daughter with a lawyer that they would pay for because his daughter was facing some sort of charges. But when Ryan's family backed out of the deal, that's why he made these statements to police. At least, that is what the police report claims. So going off of all the information that they have gathered, and I know that it's been a little bit confusing because I've been going back and forth with what the police initially say that these witnesses said and then what they later stated that was wrong about the police said that they said. But at this point, police believed the first version of every event. So for example, Megan saying that Ryan was drunk and high and was saying all these things about how him and Charles had committed this murder, you know, this is what the police were going off of, not her second statement that he actually was normal and calm that night and never said anything about the murder. So by October of 2004, police came back to Charles Erickson with an agreement that he would testify at a trial for Ryan in exchange for him pleading guilty to second degree murder and robbery for which he would serve 25 years in prison. Charles agreed to this and in a statement, he said that he was not coerced or threatened in any way for him to testify. So based on the statements given by Charles and other witnesses, police decided to move forward with the charges against Ryan Ferguson. The trial for murder started on October 14th, 2005. Of course, Charles did testify at trial, saying pretty much everything that we discussed earlier. He did say that there were many things about that night that he did not remember. However, he said that when a local newspaper came out with the story about the murder, he started to remember bits and pieces about that night and what had occurred. And he said that it was at that time that he realized that he was not actually dreaming anything, that 
he was actually remembering things. I do want to mention that neither Megan, Dallas, or Richard were called to testify at trial. Again, they all took back their statements saying that, no, I never actually said that. I'm not going to testify to that. This is what actually happened. And it sort of went against what police were trying to prove. So they didn't call them, but they did call Jerry Trump to testify. Again, he said that he did see both Charles and Ryan at the scene of the murder that night. He was able to point to Ryan and identify him as one of the men that he saw that night. So by October 21st, 2005, the jury found Ryan Ferguson guilty of second degree murder as well as robbery in the first degree and he was sentenced to 30 years for murder and 10 years for robbery to be served concurrently. However, in the years after the trial, Ryan Ryan would continue to maintain his innocence and he submitted multiple appeals and Charles started to come out to say that he no longer believed what he had testified to. By 2009, Charles had actually reached out to Ryan's attorney to tell her that he was really confused and that he actually had no recollection of the crime. He said that he put his trust into the police thinking that they had his best interests in mind. He said that he thinks that the police convinced him that him and Ryan had actually committed the crime, so he actually recanted all of his statements about Ryan's involvement. By 2012, after requesting multiple appeals, he was granted a habeas corpus hearing. This was after two witnesses took back their statements and testified that they had actually lied under oath in trial in order to benefit the prosecution. These witnesses were Jerry Trump and Charles Erickson. However, after the hearing and six and a half months of deliberation, Cole County Circuit Judge Daniel Green, he actually denied Ryan's request for a new trial, saying that Charles and Jerry's new testimonies were not credible. However, Ryan's attorney, Catherine Zellner, was not going to take no for an answer. She appealed his decision to the Western District Appellate Court of Appeals. And here, Ryan's conviction was unanimously overturned on November 5th, 2013. In this decision, the court actually did not take Charles and Jerry's recantment of their testimonies into much consideration. The judge actually cited multiple Brady violations that the prosecution had made throughout the trial. The Brady rule requires the prosecution to disclose all evidence in their possession to the defense. This includes any evidence that is favorable to the defendant showing their innocence or any evidence that shows their guilt. So literally any evidence that they have. In Ryan's trial, again, Jerry testified that he recognized Charles and Ryan from a newspaper that his wife had showed him while he was in jail on unrelated charges. But this actually was not true. The prosecution went and interviewed Jerry's wife, Barbara, and she said that she had absolutely no memory of bringing any newspaper to Jerry while he was in jail. However, the prosecution made no record of this conversation with Barbara, thus not giving it to the defense. This took away the defense's ability to cross-examine one of the prosecution's star witnesses at trial. In addition to the Brady violation, we know that Jerry also said like, hey, yeah, this actually isn't true. I just made it up. So this Brady violation is actually what led the judge to overturning the conviction conviction, but it was the recantments of both Charles and Jerry that made them decide not to retry Ryan. Because again, the only thing connecting Ryan to this crime was their testimonies. So on November 12th, 2013, Ryan Ferguson was released from prison after serving nine years, eight months, and two days. By March of 2014, Ryan filed a civil lawsuit against 11 individuals involved in the case, including Boone County in Missouri and the city of Columbia. In the suit, he accused those involved of suppressing exculpatory evidence, fabricating evidence, reckless or intentional failure to investigate, malicious prosecution, conspiracy to deprive constitutional rights, false arrest, and defamations. He was awarded $11 million, $1 million for every year that he spent in jail, and then $1 million for legal fees. 
However, I believe he ended up getting a total of around $8.5 million after different agreements were made. So with all of that being said, let's get into the evidence that shows that Ryan and Charles may have been wrongly convicted. So like I said earlier, there was DNA, fingerprints, a bloody shoe print, and a hair found at the scene or with Kent's body. None of these pieces of evidence matched with either Ryan or Charles. The DNA or the hair, neither of them matched with either of them. And then the shoe print, the size did not match Ryan or Charles. They also searched Ryan's car and there was no evidence whatsoever in the car connecting him to the crime no blood, none of Kent's belongings, nothing. This was the car that they had driven that night and allegedly right after killing Kent. So it would have been very, very hard to clean up every little speck of blood from that car, knowing how bloody the entire scene was. They had also searched Charles's home and they didn't find anything there either. Then there was further evidence that went against the timeline of when it's thought that Kent was murdered. So now going back just a little bit, Charles Erickson and Ryan Ferguson were childhood friends, but they started to drift apart once they entered high school. However, the two old friends ran into each other at a mutual friend's Halloween gathering in 2001. So together, they went to buy George the nightclub at around 11.30 p.m. They were both 17 years old at the time, so it's not really known how they got in, but my assumption is either they had fake IDs or the bouncer just was not checking anyone's IDs. Either way, it's known that the club actually closed at 1.30 a.m., so witnesses had said that they left at around 1.15 a.m. There were witnesses that came forward that said that they saw them. I will note that during the trial, the prosecution claimed that even though the club had to close at 1.30 a.m. by law, they said that they stayed opened past that time, but the prosecution gave no evidence to support that. Then there were actually 10 witnesses from that bar, including a bouncer who worked there, who all said that the bar did in fact close at 1.30 a.m. that night. I also will mention that there's absolutely no lawsuits, no paperwork, or anything to ever document that there was any incidents of this bar staying open past when they were allowed to. So there's really no evidence saying that they were open late that night and in fact, there's evidence saying against that. Then according to Ryan's cell phone records, he called his sister from the parking lot at 1.18 a.m. Then he drove Charles home, which was around 10 minutes away from the club. Again, other witnesses had come forward to say that they saw Charles and Ryan getting into the car together. And at that time, Ryan did not appear intoxicated. They said that he only seemed like he had a couple of drinks that night and that they had no reason to think that he was going to be drunk driving or a danger behind the wheel or anything like that. In terms of Charles, I don't know if he was on drugs that night. I don't know if he was really drunk. I didn't find that anywhere. If you guys know, please let me know. But for the sake of this story, it matters more so if Ryan was drunk because he was the one who was said to have been driving. Then after dropping Charles off, Ryan went home. Once he was home, he made a couple of different phone calls, which are shown on his cell phone records. All of these calls were made between 1.41 a.m. and 2.09 a.m. And once again, he was placed at his home. So unless, you know, someone else had his phone that night and was making calls off of Ryan's phone from their home and Ryan was off doing other things, it shows that he was at home. So this went against the timeline that is almost indisputable for when the murder took place. Kent's co-worker saw Kent last alive at 2.20 a.m. and his computer was logged off at 2 a.m. Now, if you want to be generous, you can say that maybe the co-worker had mixed up the times and the last time he was seen alive truly was 2 a.m. when he was confirmed to have logged off of his computer. Then within only 30 minutes at most, if you wanna say that he was last seen at 2 a.m., or 10 minutes if we believe the witness saying that they saw him at 2.20 a.m. 
So between 10 and 30 minutes, Kent was murdered. So with Ryan making these phone calls from his home between 1.41 and 2.09 a.m., that leaves a very short period of time for Ryan to have left his house, picked up Charles, killed Kent, and then left. Because again, if things are exactly the way that the police had claimed for them to be, Charles was there. So we can't say that Ryan left and did it by himself. We can't say that, you know, somehow someone else took his phone home and was making all these calls from his phone. He was 17. I honestly don't know if he would have had the forethought to say like, hey, we plan on going to rob someone. Can you, you know, take my phone home and make calls off of it while I go rob and murder somebody? That doesn't really make sense. And not saying that a 17 year old can't think that far ahead, but clearly according to what Charles said, this was a very last minute plan. So again, if we believe the testimony from Charles, they didn't plan this. This wasn't something that they woke up that morning wanting or planning to do. This was very spur of the moment. They ran out of money. They needed money. So they went and robbed someone and in the whole mess of it, they killed somebody. So I don't think that Ryan would have given his phone to somebody to take home. And if he did, that person might have come forward. It's been 20 years at this point, And I feel like by now with all the things that have been going on in this case, someone would have come forward to say like, hey, I actually was the one making these phone calls from his phone and I was the one who did this. So I know that Ryan may actually have been responsible for this or maybe they didn't come forward. I don't know, but that's so many different things that would have had to go perfectly right for this to have occurred the way the police are saying it. So again, I know I rambled a little bit, but Ryan either had to have had somebody take his phone home and make the phone calls from his phone, or he would have had to go home after dropping off Charles, make these calls, get up and have this random urge to go kill somebody, pick up Charles, go back, kill Kent, and then go home all within 10 to 30 minutes. That just does not seem reasonable. Then in addition to this, Shauna actually came forward to police to say that Charles and Ryan are actually not the men that she saw in the parking lot that night. And again, we know about Dallas saying that he never spoke to either of them that night. So knowing all of this, it all shows that neither Ryan or Charles are involved. And many people believe that Ryan was wrongly prosecuted and that Charles is still sitting in jail for a crime that he did not commit. It's just crazy to me that all of these people came out and said that, hey, police wrote this down, but this is actually what I said. That reminds me a lot of another case that I covered recently, the Daniel Robinson case, where his dad at least and a couple of other people said that, hey, I didn't actually say that. They just wrote down that I said that, but I don't remember saying that exact thing verbatim. So we know that there's multiple cases that this has happened. So I wouldn't put it past it to have happened in this case because it's just, it's kind of unreasonable to think that all of these people came together and said, hey, like I know we all just confessed or I know we all just, you know, put Ryan at the crime scene and I know we all said that he was, you know, trying to confess to a murder, but let's all just take back those statements later and, you know, make police look like idiots or something. I don't know. Like I, I do think that police may have twisted their words because so many people coming forward with the same thing that has to have some weight to it. But either way, Charles had submitted multiple appeals and as recently as June of 2020, all of them have been denied. It's much harder for him to get this murder conviction appealed since he did plead guilty. However, Charles is set to be released on parole in January of next year. He has come out to say that his guilty plea was due to aggressive, coercive police tactics, Ryan actually went on to say, quote, there are more innocent people in prison, including Erickson. I know that he was used and manipulated and I kind of feel sorry for the guy. He needs help. He needs support. He doesn't belong in prison, which to me is kind of a big thing for somebody to say. It's a very mature thing for him to say because Charles is the one that landed Ryan in jail for 10 years, which is a really good chunk of his life. And he's still coming out there to say like, hey, like, 
I know what happened. I think that police used Charles and this is why he's still in jail. So I do think that's a really mature thing for him to come out and say. So as of right now or last that I saw, Ryan's family is offering a $10,000 reward for any information that leads to Kent's true killers. Charles continues to fight for his freedom and is appealing in any way that he can to this day. However, even with all of this information, I do still have a few questions. What made Charles suddenly have a dream or realization that he may have been involved? That sort of makes me think that maybe on Halloween night that Charles really was drunk and on drugs and that he couldn't remember that night and that he had gaps in his memory and then he saw the newspaper article and then suddenly he thought like, you know, I can't remember this night. I also read this article that kind of resonates with me for whatever reason. I think I may have done it. That could have been why, but if any of you guys know the answer to that, please let me know because I couldn't find that anywhere. I also want to know, why did police get such tunnel vision? Why did they set their sights so hard on these two when it seemed so clear that they weren't involved? Were police just trying to get this solved as quickly as possible, no matter who ended up in jail, just to appease the public? Did they truly believe that these two committed the crime and they were just trying to find evidence that fit that? Or did they personally have something against these two? Sometimes it happens in investigations where police get their sights set on something and instead of, you know, finding all the evidence and seeing where it leads them, they think, okay, these two might be involved, so let's find any evidence that fits our theory. I genuinely wish that I knew more about this. I read police documents, I read court papers, and I couldn't really find any information about why police believed so strongly that these two men were involved. So if you know more about this, please let me know in the comments. As far as I've heard about both Charles and Ryan, it seems like they were relatively normal teenagers. Maybe they, you know, drank alcohol. It seems like they did. Maybe they used drugs or maybe they didn't. Some witnesses say that they did both. Some witnesses say that they only drank casually like teenagers do. So I don't really know what's true and what's not. I don't know if these two had gotten into trouble at school or with police around the area for lesser crimes and police thought like, hey, like these two are troublemakers, they're probably involved. I genuinely don't know why these two in specific were the ones that police decided to target. A lot of people are also angry that police didn't look more into the coworker, Michael Boyd, since he was the last person who actually saw Kent alive. I don't know if I think he had something to do with it. We don't know enough about Michael to say if he had anything against Kent or if he had a motive for this or anything. I'd really be curious to know, but unfortunately, we just don't know anything right now. The other possibilities, of course, are that this was just a random attack, but then again, he was killed with such brutality. It makes me wonder if this was a personal attack. I don't really know. Clearly, his car was robbed. Clearly, someone went through his car, but I wonder if they thought that he had something. I don't know. I just really hope that police continue to investigate this case, but they have someone in jail for it. So even though it is clear, or at least it seems clear that Charles is not responsible, I'm assuming that police probably just see this case as closed and they don't care enough to actually look into the case and find the true murderers of Kent. Maybe I just have a negative outlook on it. Maybe they are investigating further after all of this came out, but who truly knows? This case is just so scary to me because this type of thing can happen to just about anybody. Anybody could be in the wrong place at the wrong time and get caught up in something like this. If Ryan and Charles truly are innocent, then the only thing that they went to jail for as long as they have is going out and having fun on their Halloween night. It literally could have been anyone. All you can do is just 
hope that the police in your area are the honest ones that just seek the truth rather than being the ones that just go out and want to look good to the public and will put anyone behind bars for any crime because they just want to show that, you know, they can solve crimes quickly. My heart goes out to Ryan and Charles if they truly are innocent, and I do think that there's a very good argument to say that they are. My heart also goes out to Kent and his children and his wife. They lost a man who seemed like such a good, genuine man for absolutely no reason. Then they have to see this entire thing, their loved one's murder, be turned into a case about Ryan and Charles. I do have to say that a frustrating thing about this case is that when I look up Kent's name, almost all of the articles, podcasts, videos that I see on this case are the case of Ryan Ferguson. And yes, Ryan is a victim. He is a victim and he lost 10 years of his life. But Kent is who this case is about at the end of the day. I don't know what Kent's family had believed or what they believe now, but at one point, I'm sure they felt like they had closure because they probably thought that the police did their due diligence and did their work in getting the people responsible behind bars, only to have them released from prison, documentaries made about them, and find out that they may have been wrongly convicted. It must be so gut-wrenching knowing that the person responsible for Kent's murder is probably still out there and I can't even imagine how that feels. So yes, let's hope that Ryan is living a great life. As most recently as I've seen, he's actually going on the amazing race, so seems like he's doing pretty good for himself. Let's hope that Charles finds the justice that he deserves, and if he truly is innocent, I hope he's released and, you know, is able to put this past him sooner than later. But also let's not forget that Kent lost his life for absolutely no reason. Let's hope that everybody involved will get the justice that they deserve. The Innocence Projects and other organizations are trying to do what they can to spread awareness about people who are in jail on false confessions or fabricated evidence or wrongful convictions. A lot of the information that I was able to get was from the website freecharleserickson.org. They have everything that you could possibly need to know about the trial, about what happened, about false confessions, how it happens, or how people end up in jail for crimes that they didn't commit. They have listed the 911 call, a bunch of court documents, a bunch of police reports. They have so many different things. So if you want to know more about the case, I would definitely suggest going ahead and checking out that website. Of course, it will be linked down below and there is a lot of reading if you want to find out more. But that is all I have for today's case and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Charles is truly innocent? Do you think that police coerced a confession out of him? What do you think about Ryan being released? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and use the link down below or the QR code that I showed in the beginning of the video to get 65% off of your Babbel subscription. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send the suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!